Hello and welcome to Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. In this video, we're taking a bit of a break from the Italian Exotica, which has become the norm, and we're looking at some interesting cars which are very much close to my heart and part of my history, personally, but are also sort of coming back into vogue again after years of being in the doldrums. That's the Bentley T2 and the Turbo R, the later version, if you like. The T2 is a surprisingly rare car. Rolls-Royce and Bentley were one and the same in the 1970s and 80s, really. Same company, almost the same products. Slightly different, as we'll see. But the similarities between this and the Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow 2 were negligible. Um, you had the different grille. This was actually not standard, this flying B. Um, you got the B badge on the headlights. You got the Bentley instead of RR on the instruments and the same on the hub caps, the wheel trims. That's it. This particular T2 is quite a rare beast. Uh, they made 558 only in total. But the amazing thing is they made 8,400 Shadow 2s. So for every one Bentley that was sold at the time, there were 15 equivalent Rolls Royces coming off the production line. Crew had almost completely forgotten the Bentley brand, which is shocking when you consider how strong it is these days in comparison. So it was all but neglected. These, to me, represented a high point in the, the sort of late 20th century Rolls-Royce and Bentley situation because they were really hand-built cars in every sense of the word. I am being slightly biased because I started my working life working on these cars day in, day out. I've probably worked literally on hundreds of them, I would say, of the Rolls-Royce and Bentley Silver Shadow and T-Series. So they are quite close to my heart. I started life at when I was 19, working in a Rolls-Royce and Bentley service centre. But the T2 is potentially quite an interesting car to drive. All through the 70s, the, the Silver Shadows and Bentley T-Types had a real reputation. They were called roly-polies um, because the handling was so awful on them. You sort of went into a corner and waited for the rest of the car to catch up, really. But things changed with the T2 a little bit. They got rack and pinion steering, which is much more direct. The early cars literally were like this. You could do that driving down the road and it made no difference because the chief engineer, a guy called Harry Grills, um, had insisted on what he called the sneeze factor being built into the steering. So you didn't go across a motorway if you suddenly sneezed. Bit of an exaggeration really, as we know. You ended up with very vague steering, even when it was in prime uh, health. These were a bit different. They sharpened it up. In 1969, they changed from Armstrong to Girling shock absorbers, and that was a big mistake because that was what gave the Shadow and the T-Series its terrible reputation for handling. Because the Armstrong shock absorbers were great, the Girling ones were worn out after about 3,000 miles, and the car started rolling and pitching and one thing or another. In the 1980s, I started fitting Harvey Bailey handling kits, which uh, a, friend of, a guy who became a friend of mine, Roddy Harvey Bailey, uh, invented a handling kit for these. He was a very clever suspension engineer and he devised a handling kit for these cars. Different springs, different anti-roll bars and a set of decent quality Boga or Bilstein shock absorbers. And it made the world of difference to these cars. And with this kit fitted and at some decent shocks, they really do handle. They drive incredibly well. I've had some interesting run-ins on A-roads uh, quite shocked people in the 1980s driving XR3i Escorts behind me in the rain and they couldn't understand why I was losing them round corners. Um, anyway, a lifetime away from now. But um, this particular car uh, I've known since 1984. The second owner bought the car from Jack Barclays in Barclays Square in 1984. It's a 1979 car. It's still got the original number plates on from 1979 with the Jack Barkley logo embossed on them. It's never had a different number on. And I serviced the car for him during the 1980s all the way through and I alternated with the service centre, the Rolls-Royce service centre, which was in existence then at Crew, which serviced customers' cars. That's what people would send their cars almost from all over the world to the factory at Crew. Now it's Bentley, then it was Rolls-Royce and Bentley, and they would service them, do whatever, repair them, restore them, and send them back again. And um, I would do one service on this car, and uh, they would do another, and vice versa. Uh, I don't know who he was checking up on, but um, one of us, obviously. Um, and it's stamped in the book. Here it is. You can see Tyrrell Engineering from way back, then Rolls-Royce Service Centre at Crewe. 
and this is an original service pack. You can see it's still got its full history of services and this lovely handbook going right back to when the car was in its prime, really. So I've had a, a bit of an issue with this car. Uh, it's not been running too smoothly. It needed a bit of a birthday. It's got some very old fashioned SU carburettors on it. Skinner Union SU stood for, and they've been around for over 100 years, SU. The carburettors on this are called HIF7s, Horizontal Integral Float Chamber. And I'm gonna tune these. They're quite unusual in that you tune the mixture rich by screwing the screw in and lean to unscrew the screw, which is the opposite way to the way most carburettors work. The only carburettors that work this way are some Hollies. So I'm gonna tune it up and then I'm gonna take it for a run and hopefully it still handles really well. Well, you should, in theory, be able to balance a coin on these when they're done. So let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to risk it too long, <laughs> but it's there or thereabouts. One of the interesting facets of this car is the engine, the big V8, as it's come to be known at Crewe. Um, it first appeared in the Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud II, uh, which was in 19... 59 and um, 1960 and it was very much modeled on American V8s and um, at the time in Detroit they were coming up with thin wall casting technology for cast iron cylinder blocks uh, which a lot of engines went on to use that became sort of staple for Ford and GM at, at Detroit but um, Rolls-Royce cho chose another route they went with an alloy block um, and uh, alloy heads so the whole engine is an alloy V8 uh, but very much along similar principles to the, the Detroit V8s. They actually uh, bought an Oldsmobile Toronado crew secretly um, to develop the V8 engine and possibly the concept, as the Oldsmobile did, of the, the big Hivo chain, the big chain drive front wheel drive, uh, which they never went to. But um, Rolls-Royce originally conceived two models of the Silver Shadow, uh, Tibet and Burma, they were codenamed. Tibet had a much longer front than this and because they experimented with a straight eight engine instead of a V8 uh, or even a V12. But um, they ended up using the V8 and the uh, Tibet was the longer one. And then they realized that if they kept the car under 17 feet long, um, it actually affected the price of the car quite drastically because the difference shipping cars to the US in containers between a car that was under 17 feet long and over 17 feet was quite substantial. And I believe for that reason they left the bumpers off them till they got to the US so that uh, it kept the car under 17 feet long. And that way uh, obviously the import duties, the shipping duties were less and um, it was cheaper for them to sell them in the States. And the Shadow, in particular, sold in their droves in the US. It had a magnificent record as a dollar earner for uh, crew for the factory. Um, but uh, so this car has got the V8. Uh, it's essentially very heavily modified, but essentially still the same engine that's used today in the Mulsanne. And uh, it really has been a very, very good engine. They had some problems with it when it first came out in the Silver Cloud 2. Camshafts wore prematurely and things like that. They sorted all that out and provided you change the oil on these engines, they're really, really, really reliable. Um, so what I'm going to do, I mean, obviously she's running really smoothly. I'm just warming her through. I mean, she is warm already, really. We'll take her around the corner and uh, give her a bit of a workout. 
Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, with the handling kit on, and with the suspension really in good shape, um, you can hustle these cars. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to open her up, give her a little hustle, and uh, a little bit of left foot braking through this bend, and we'll actually take the corner at far more speed than this car has any right to. Try doing that in a silver shadow without uh, a handling kit or any other goodies. Uh, it just won't like it at all. Uh, it's a, it was a dream to be able to make these cars handle like that, but handle it does. And it makes it a really, really fun car to drive. Whoever would have thought that. Again, I've got another bend coming up here, so just a dab on the brakes, tiny dab, through the bend, nice and level. Throttle, power out, and there she is. Takes the corner beautifully, negligible roll, quite incredible really. Same again. Even though it wasn't meant to be, this could be a, almost a sports car, if you use your imagination enough. Well, here we are fast forwarding now to 1994. Um, that's the year of this car. This is a Bentley Turbo R. Very interesting the way Bentley managed in a very short space of time to reinvent themselves and actually to overtake Rolls-Royce. It's amazing the way fads and, and things change. And the really big thing was the, uh, the, the Bentley Mulsanne Turbo. That's what changed things. 1982, if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure people will correct me if I'm wrong, um, that the Mulsanne Turbo came out. It was mechanically very similar to the Shadow 2 earlier. Same engine, just about different rear suspension, different type of brake fluid, but other than that, the, the floor pan and the underpinnings were very similar. And the performance was very similar, unsurprisingly. Um, but what crew did was bolt a Garrett T04 turbocharger onto the engine. At that time, it had a big carburetor, a Solex 4A1, and the, the whole thing worked extremely well. It really did. The power was up 30% instantly to around about 300 brake horsepower. Doesn't sound a lot, but it's the torque that's the big thing to worry about or, or mention. Bags of torque. And uh, they went like the wind, and the acceleration for a car of that era and of that weight was sensational. And what happened then in 1985, they brought out an, another car called the Bentley Turbo R. Because the problem with the Mulsanne Turbo was, it went really well in a straight line. Soon as you got to the corners, it was another roly-poly Rolls-Royce Bentley, albeit with better dampers. They actually had the sense to fit Boga dampers at crew from Spirit generation onwards, which actually carried on working, which the Girlings didn't. So, better car in some respects. But the interesting thing is, the Mulsan Turbo and the crew were very conservative in the way they did things, generally speaking. The drive line, the brakes, the suspension, everything were all the same as the previous Mulsanne, the Shadow 2, the Bentley T2. Um, and they still considered them robust enough to accept the extra power. And they did. I mean, the diffs, you know, nothing unsavory happened with the drive line, particularly. The diffs were still up to it. Brakes, to a large extent, were up to the performance, etc. That's a testament to Crew's build quality. They got a lot of things wrong but they got a lot of things right too. And the Turbo R was just a great car. And it was the first car to have alloy wheels from crew as well. 1985, Camargue 5000 series Rolls-Royce came out with alloy wheels, just a little bit before that possibly. And again, the engineering department were, were terribly conservative and the styling department were on their case to incorporate alloy wheels in their cars and they just resisted it. And those frumpy old steel wheels with pressed stainless steel hubcaps carried on for far too long, really. Um, Turbo R came of age in 1985, then it gained fuel injection, which it desperately needed, again, because the engineers at crew limped on with a carburetor for far too long, and ABS in 1987. And it also developed the four round headlights instead of the rectangular ones that the Silver Spirit had. This is a more powerful car. Turbo R's are a bit like wines. You have good years and bad years. Uh, so, for example, this is a good year because it's got the four-speed automatic gearbox and it's also got the Zytec engine management system, which took things to a whole new level, really. 
But 1991 Turbo R's have got the four-speed automatic gearbox, but they were also the first cars to have a catalyst fitted. And it really robbed them of power. It just took the edge off the acceleration. Amazing, really. So 91, not the best year, still a great car, but 93, 94, really, really good car. Uh, they altered the dashboard, but these cars really go well. And this particular car is a personal favorite of mine because it was owned by a pediatric surgeon, a customer of mine in the early noughties. I've been looking after it for about 15 years and he passed away and I've still maintained that relationship with the car. And it's had a running fault, which was potentially difficult to find, really badly running, not pulling properly, not picking up. Actually, it turned out to just be an induction pipe with a pinhole in it that needed replacing. Great. I'm going to give this car a run now to make sure it's okay. The R in Turbo R is for road holding. So what crew did was actually uprate the suspension. They went for stiffer dampers, actually, instead of stiffer springs and anti-roll bars, which I've spoken to various very clever suspension people since, and they said that's sort of the wrong way to go, because all a damper does is actually damp whatever springing you have there already. And that's why on modern cars, uh, certainly in the early years of cars with switchable damping, they weren't really a great success. You either ended up with a harsh ride or a car that was quite wallowy, because it's the springing that's the important bit, not the shock absorbers. The shock absorbers just damp whatever the springing is. I'm sure I'll have lots of people saying, no, that's not the case, but that's my experience talking over a beer or a pork pie or whatever with some very, very clever suspension people. Anyway, the vast majority of people wouldn't know, wouldn't care. It goes round corners. It's a bit bumpy on the ride, but still a great, great car, actually, and an important part. It reinvented Bentley. It brought them back into the frame, brought them back into fame, and that's why the Bentley brand is uh, as popular and as strong as it is. Let's give it a run. One of the things that amazes me about these cars, uh, when I mentioned before about crew getting it wrong, um, I'm six feet, but I'm quite long in the body and my head is touching the roof. Uh, you know, it amazes me that car manufacturers build such big cars and yet, you know, they're actually not big enough for a, a, a slightly larger person or, uh, you know, that kind of thing. It's, um, it's just incredible, really, that uh, they start with a clean sheet and um, get it so wrong. Um, it probably helps if I recline the seat a bit more. Uh, but even so, you take my point. Um, this car is obviously running better. Uh, it's as smooth as you like now. It's, uh, it's idling smoothly. It's pulling nicely. Uh, and the big V8, it's like the legendary American V8s. They've been improved upon over the decades, the small block Chevy, uh, whatever else. But um, they, just, they just keep reinventing them. And, you know, they, they meet the emissions laws. They meet all sorts of things. And, and this big V8 from Crew is the same. And the amount of power they eked out of it, uh, and still do, is, um, is very, very good. Um, they went into over to, um, just to be nerdy for a moment, they went over to cross-bolted main bearings in 1989 to improve the strength of the bottom end because they did suffer with feathered main bearings. But, you know, that's, that's to be expected, really. It's just development. Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, fixing, replacing that pipe has solved the induction air leak problem uh, that it had. So it's running really sweet and smooth now, low down. But I'm just going to open it up. Um, and see if it's all there. Here we go. Yeah. Really, really, really quick. And the brakes work as well. Always a bonus. And again, it does take the corners well. Got to remember this car's two and a quarter tons and I can I can hustle it through the bends um, quite remarkably, really. Obviously, things have moved on now. We live in the age of bi-turbo V12 Mercedes and uh, all sorts of, you know, uber-powerful saloon cars, Teslas developing huge power. But there's still something really, really um, visceral and satisfying about a big turbocharged V8 propelling you just magical.
and it is such big fun to hustle such a big car around. You can you can chuck it around, and if you really want to, um, don't try this at home. But you can actually get the back end out on it uh, and just give it a bit of oversteer and opposite lock and whatever. Just great fun. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll be back soon.